Uh, well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and uh, thank you again for having me online to preach with you uh, in your series through 1 Kings. I uh, always appreciate uh, our gospel partnership and i um, really thankful to be able to share God's word with you this morning. The sermon is entitled The Danger of Defiance. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 13. Uh, you should have an outline you can refer to and uh, I encourage you to have your Bibles open uh, because you, you can follow along uh, with, with what I'm saying uh, and checking that it's uh, faithful to God's word. Let's, let's pray. Let's ask for God's help that we would understand that we'd be changed by God's word this morning. Let me lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that when you speak, your word is certain and true. Help me now not only to preach your word faithfully, uh, but to respond to it myself in humility. Help us all to heed your word this morning and to respond rightly in repentance and faith that we may receive your certain promise and blessing and not your judgment. We pr pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The danger of defiance, the danger of Defiance. I wonder if you've heard of Anthony Weiner. Uh, he was a politician in uh, the United States. Back in 1991, it seemed like he had it all. At age 27, he became the youngest member ever on the New York City Council. Uh, shortly afterwards, in 1998, uh, with his political career on the rise, uh, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Until in 2011, he was caught sexting. He was forced to resign from Congress. Uh, two years later, he caught, got caught doing it again, uh, and he had to scrap his plans to run for New York City's mayor. And then it happened again, a third time, 2016. This time he was caught doing it with a teen. Uh, his wife separated from him. Uh, the various news agents cut cords with him, and he ended up in jail. His whole life evaporated uh, before his eyes. Uh, it is a story that is far too common. Uh, people who think that because of their position and their power that they are untouchable, they can live lives of sin and it will have no consequences. Uh, there are many such stories that we hear in churches too, of pastors and preachers that seem outwardly to have successful ministries until their defiance, their disobedience, is exposed. And in an instant, their whole ministry dissolves. Often their family breaks apart. It all comes to nothing. Now, our passage today is about the danger of defiance. It's about the certain consequences that we will face if we willfully disobey the word of the Lord, if we refuse to repent of evil and do what God says. God's word is sure. Uh, it must be heeded. Whether you're a king or you're a prophet, no one is immune. No one is untouchable. No matter how much power or position they have, if they, if we, persist in defiance against the sovereign God, the consequences are inevitable. Now, we're looking at 1 Kings, and the writer of 1, uh, of 1 Kings is tracing the reasons for the downfall of Israel and Judah. Uh, we've seen in the previous chapters the rise of Solomon, his fame, his wisdom, his wealth. But tragically, despite God's abundant blessing, we've seen Solomon fell into idolatry and sin. He did the three things that God's Old Testament law forbade for his kings. He had lots of weapons, he had wealth, he had wives, the three W's. He amassed weapons and weapons from Egypt. He, he amassed great wealth, abundant gold for himself and much other things too. And of course, the wives, over 1,000 wives and concubines. And all these things turned his heart from the Lord. And in judgment, God declared that the kingdom would be divided into the northern kingdom Israel, the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom Judah. But for the sake of David, the kingdom would not be lost entirely. One tribe would be reserved for Judah, ruled by Solomon's son, Rehoboam. 
while the ten tribes of Israel would pass over to Jer Jeroboam. And in chapters 11 to 12, we've then seen the promise for Jeroboam and his failure. The promise. Now, if he faithfully obeyed God's commands, God would bless him and establish his house. And then the failure. Building two golden calves in the north and in the south, setting up his own priests and festivals and sacrifices, all in rejection of the word of the Lord. Uh, we read in chapter 12, verse 32, So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. He instituted a feast for the people of Israel. They went up to the altar to make offerings. So Jeroboam, insists on his own way in defiance of God's law, in defiance of God's word. He sets up his own system of worship to establish his own rule. And now as we come to chapter 13, God's unstoppable word of judgment comes. His word that is always true, his word that must always be heeded, his word that must always be obeyed, even by kings and by the prophets who deliver it. Uh, so let's uh, begin the first point, when God's king defies him. When God's king defies him. Uh, chapter 13 begins with Jeroboam standing at the altar of his new uh, temple in Bethel. Uh, it's, it's ready there to dedicate it to his God. It's much like uh, Solomon did in chapter 8, verse 22. Uh, getting ready to dedicate his temple in prayer to the Lord. But unlike Solomon, Jeroboam gets no chance to speak. He gets no chance to pray because his altar is a corruption. His golden calf is idolatry and God will not accept his worship. And so he sends a prophet, a, a man of God, with a word of judgment on the altar. Look at uh, verse 1. Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you and human bones shall be burned on you. It's a gruesome picture, isn't it? But the prophecy is clear. It is the house of David that are the legitimate rulers, not the house of Jeroboam. It's the temple of God in Jerusalem that's the true temple, not this golden calf that Jeroboam has set up. And so the prophet utters this horrific Judgment. The altar will be desecrated through the burning of human bones on it and the slaughter of the illegitimate priests who offer the sacrifices. Now, this judgment is still some time to come. Josiah is only going to do this many years later. Uh, we'll read it in 2 Kings chapter 23. Uh, and so that the prophet gives an immediate sign to show that these are no empty words from the Lord. Look at verse 3. He gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And immediately this happens. If you jump down to verse 5, we're told the altar was also was torn down. The ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word. Of the Lord. You see it repeated all through those first five verses of the by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord. God's word is certain. God's word is unstoppable. If God declares something will happen, it will happen. God says the altar will be broken, the ashes poured out, it happens. Because his word is to be heeded, his word is to be obeyed, or certain judgment will follow. Now, rather than heeding the word of the Lord, rather than repenting of his idolatry and evil, Jeroboam instead decides to turn 
on the messenger. Look at verse 4. When the king heard the saying of the men of God, which he cried out against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. So Jeroboam decides to silence the messenger. He doesn't like the word, so he wants to lock him up. But it leads only to immediate judgment. His, his hand shriveled up. He has no power uh, to stop the word of God. And so verse 6, stopped in his tracks, the king said to the men of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the men of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and it became as it was before. Now, it's amazing that God in his grace hears Jeroboam's pleas for mercy, and God, is, and God heals him immediately. It's a sign, isn't it, that God is gracious, that God is ready and willing to forgive Jeroboam if he would but turn from his evil. But of course he doesn't turn from his evil ways. All he wants is his hand healed. He doesn't try to fix his broken system of worship. So instead he tries to bribe the prophet uh, verse 7, the king said to the men of God, Come home with me. Refresh yourself. I will give you a reward. Now, that's Jeroboam thinking to himself here. Well, if the man of God had such power to reverse God's word of judgment on his hand, then perhaps also this prophet has the same power to reverse God's word of judgment against the altar. And, and so he tries to buy him off. Look, come back. Let's have lunch together. I'll reward you. Yet God has already cautioned his prophet against exactly this. God does not want his messengers bought off by money. Look at verse 8. The men of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way, and he did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. So here we discover that the prophet is to go directly to Bethel, bring the message, and then go back another route. It's clear that God requires radical and complete obedience to his command. Uh, God's prophet must not place themselves in a position of compromise. Uh, they must not allow themselves to be led astray. They must not allow themselves to be bribed by money or rewards if they will simply change the message. The book of Jude issues a similar warning uh, in the New Testament. This is Jude 22. He writes, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear having even the, hating even the garment stained by sin. So, yes, go and warn others. Seek to rescue others from God's judgment. Warn them of what's coming. But take care. Do not share in their evil ways. Hate even the garment stained by the, by the flesh. Because God expects complete and radical obedience to his word. And he expects that even from those who deliver it, especially from those who deliver it. And that's really the, the point of the rest of the chapter. We leave Jeroboam behind for most of the chapter uh, because we find that although the man of God begins well, he refuses the invitation of King Jeroboam. He, he, re he returns directly home, as God said. But as he goes, we discover his obedience is not complete. His obedience fails with disastrous consequences. So in verses 11 and 12, we're introduced to another prophet, a sinister old prophet from Samaria who comes with some shady motives. Look at verse 11. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. 
They also told their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the men of God who came from Judah had gone. So this old prophet, he knows God's message of judgment against Jeroboam and against Bethel. He knows that God has told the man of God to return directly home and not to eat or drink with anyone along the way. But knowing all these things, he decides to pursue him anyway. Verse 13, he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it and he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. He said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. The old prophet tempts the man of God. He invites him for a meal to come back with him, knowing full well that God has commanded him not to do exactly that. Perhaps we're not told exactly why he does this. Perhaps for similar reasons to Jeroboam, because he lives in Bethel. Maybe he doesn't want his bones dug up and desecrated on the altar. Maybe he wants the prophecy reversed, like Jeroboam does. We simply don't know. Uh, The prophet, once again, faithfully refuses. Initially, look at verse 16. He said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. So far, so good. Yet again, the, the man of God is faithful. He obeys the word of the Lord. He does not compromise himself in any way. But then comes the shock. Then comes the twist. The old prophet lies. Look at verse 18. He said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Now, again, we're not told why the old prophet lies. But the man of God clearly should have known better. He had God's clearly revealed word. He must not go back. He must not eat or drink along the way. He knew God's command. He's repeated it twice. He's obeyed God's command, even so far against the king of Jeroboam and his rich offer of reward. So when this rival word, this opposite prophecy comes, he should have recognized it for the lie that it was. He should have rejected it. But he did not. Instead, he he listened to the lie. Verse 19 says, he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. We also know the word of the Lord. We have the gospel revealed to us. God has shown us his truth. In his word. We know what about the death and resurrection of Jesus. We know about the Trinity. We know that we're saved by faith and not by works. We know that God has not promised us health and wealth and prosperity now, but only when Jesus returns and so on. We know this. It's clearly revealed in God's word. And so when someone else comes along and they say something opposite, no, it's faith plus works. No, you can have prosperity now or whatever the false teaching is. We should recognize it for the lie that it is. We should reject it. We should walk away from it because we have the clearly revealed word of the Lord in our Bibles in front of us. And this passage warns us of the drastic, the dreadful consequences when we do not hold on to the revealed word of the Lord. What we discover is that God judges the man of God. And just as Jeroboam's disobedience prompted sure and certain judgment from God, so now the prophet's defiance meets God's judgment too. Uh, In another kind of surprising twist, we discover that this old prophet, this lying prophet, now delivers a true prophecy that is from the Lord. 
A reminder, I guess, that even false prophets can speak the truth sometimes. But verse 20, As they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. He cried to the man of God who came from Judah, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but you have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. It's a heavy judgment, isn't it? When King Jeroboam defiantly resisted the word of the Lord, wanted to lock up God's prophet, the result was a withered hand. And immediately he was healed by God's mercy. But God's defiant prophet here receives no such mercy, no such second chances. Because he is God's messenger, he is judged more strictly. He's given the sentence of death. It reminds us of James chapter 3, verse 1. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. You see, we must never think as teachers of God's word that we are above God's word. God hates hypocrisy. God demands radical obedience to his word, especially from those who deliver his word to others. And so if you are a Sunday school teacher or youth leader, an elder, a deacon, a small group leader, a preacher in the church, then you, I, we must heed God's word, even as we bring it to others. Listen to the words of Paul in Romans chapter 2. He says this, if you are sure that you yourself, this is chapter 2 verse 19, Romans 2 verse 19. He says that if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. So if you are going to say to people, you must obey the word of the Lord, will you obey it yourself? Because God will hold us all accountable. None of us are exempt, whether we're a leader, prophet, preacher, even the king of Israel. Well, this prophecy is fulfilled immediately. And God's judgment falls on the man in a rather strange way, doesn't it? Verse 23. After he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. His body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. It's a rather odd situation, isn't it? You have a lion standing next to a donkey and a human body. I and mean, surely this is lunch for the lion. I mean, he kills, he's killed the prophet. Why doesn't he eat him and why doesn't he eat the donkey at the same time? Time. Surely the donkey should run away. Surely the lion should enjoy his lunch. But they don't. The donkey just stands there. The lion just stands there. And as they do, it's a very clear uh, sign that this is God's supernatural intervention. It makes it plain for anyone to see that the death of this man of God was not some unlucky accident that he just happened to run into a lion on the way. But it's the action of the sovereign God. It's the fulfillment of his word by the old prophet. It is his judgment. Again, it's the reminder. God is sovereign. He always keeps his word. If we defy him, his judgment is certain. And so his word must always be heeded, especially by those who bring it to others. Now this is underlined in how the old prophet understands what has happened. Verse 26. When the prophet who brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. 
Therefore the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. See, the strange circumstances of this man of God's death, they only further heightened the fact that he was a true prophet, bringing the true word of the Lord. Now, that, that, that is, when he said he must not eat or drink or return on the way, it, it shows that that prophecy was true. And therefore, his other prophecy about Jeroboam and Bethel and, and, and so on was true as well. And, and this is what the old prophet recognizes, verse 27. Uh, he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. They settled it. He went and found the body thrown in the road and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. He laid the body in his own grave. They mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. Now, again, we're not told exactly why does he do this. After all, it was this old prophet who caused the man of God's death in the first place. If he hadn't have lied to him, then none of this would have happened. Perhaps it's a sign of respect for the man of God who he now recognizes as a true prophet like him. After all, he calls him his brother and so on. But perhaps there's still sinister motives going on here. Perhaps it's still yet another attempt for him to secure his peaceful rest in the grave. Now, we need to remember at this point the prophecy that the man of God delivered. Go back to verse 2 with me. The man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you. And human bones shall be burned on you. Perhaps he's worried that his bones is going to be disturbed when this prophecy is fulfilled. His explanation, verses 31 to 32, seems to suggest this. Verse 31 says, After he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the men of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. He knows that the word of the prophet is true. He may well be honored in the end. Maybe that's what he's after. If he knows that when the prophecy comes true, if he's buried with him, maybe he can share in the honor too. But maybe it's just about having his bones spared from that desecration when they're dug up and put on the altar. For if, uh, for, for if uh, even God's prophet is, is not spared from the judgment, then certainly King Jeroboam is not going to be spared from the judgment that God has prophesied. And, and it seems that uh, if that was what his motives were, that the old prophet succeeds. Now, we're told in chapter, 2 Kings chapter 23 that when the judgment comes, his bones are not disturbed with the others. Josiah says this in 2 Kings 23 and verse 17. Then he said, what is that mon monument that I see? The men of the city told him, it's the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and projected these things that you have done against the altar of Bethel. Verse 18. And he said, let him be. Let no man move his bones. And so they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came out of Samaria. Was that his motive? To lie, to bring down the prophet, to preserve his own rest. Well, despite all that has happened, Jeroboam is hardened in defiance. Despite all these clear signs that God's word of judgment will be fulfilled. He does not repent. He does not turn back. He continues in his way. And so the chapter closes again with Jeroboam, verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. 
and this thing became sin in the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. So Jeroboam is hardened in his defiance. He does not turn from his idolatry. He continues in, in his idolatrous sacrifices. He continues to appoint unqualified priests, not from the Levites. And it all spells his certain downfall, the destruction of his family, the end of his dynasty. It's very sad indeed how this chapter ends. Remember what God had promised Jeroboam back in chapter 11, verse 38. God said to Jeroboam, If you will listen to all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, <coughs> I will be with you. I will build you a sure house as I built for David. and I will give Israel to you. It's a marvelous promise. God promised Jeroboam <coughs> If he would be obedient, God would bless him. He would establish his house, his dynasty. But sadly, like Solomon, he chose the path of disobedience. <coughs> he would not turn from his evil way. And it spelled his downfall. There's a play on the word return all the way through this chapter. The man of God was not to return by the way. When he did return by the way, well, he was brought back dead in the end. Jeroboam would not return by the way. He would not turn from his evil. And so he would face God's judgment. Well, let's conclude. What do we learn from this strange story with all of its twists and turns? Now, the first thing that we must learn here is that God is sovereign and his sovereign and his supreme word must be heeded. God is sovereign and his supreme word must be heeded. The passage makes it absolutely clear that God is in control. And when God says something, it will happen. God gave a sign that the altar would be broken down and its ashes would be poured out. And in verse 5, it, when it happened, we are told it happened according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. That the man of God was told he must not eat bread or drink or return by the same way. But when he did and was punished, verse 26, we're told it happened according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And the old prophet, at the end of the chapter, he recognizes that the same word that proclaimed judgment on Jeroboam, Bethel, and so on, would be fulfilled. Verse, uh, at the end of the chapter, the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the house of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. And that is exactly what happens, isn't it? The word of the man of God is fulfilled. By Josiah. The, 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 the bones are dug up and put on the altar. The, the priests are slain by Josiah, just as God had spoken. Look at 2 Kings 23 and verse 15. 2 Kings 23 and verse 15. We read this. Moreover, the altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to the dust. He also burned the Asherah. And as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mount. And he sent, he took the bones out of the tombs. He burned them on the altar and defiled it. Here it is. According to the word of the Lord that the man of God had proclaimed, who predicted these things. Do you see the point? God is sovereign. If God says it will happen, it will happen. And so his word must be heeded. God's word cannot be stopped. It cannot be thwarted. God is sovereign. He is in control of history. And that's abundantly clear when he sends the lion. It's abundantly clear in so many ways in this passage. God is in control. We must Listen to him. 
The second thing we learn is that disobedience is serious and carries certain consequences. Disobedience is serious and carries certain consequences. God is sovereign and always fulfills his word. And so if we defy him, then that is very serious. Jeroboam's defiance against the men of God is swiftly punished with his hand withered. The defiance of the men of God is sw swiftly dealt with as he's torn up by a lion. And the willful disobedience of Jeroboam and the kings that followed him would not go unpunished either. Jeroboam's house was cut off from the face of the earth. And so there's a warning for us here in this passage that we must not trifle with the word of God. We must not think that we can get away with defiance and God will do nothing. God has commanded us that we repent of our sins and turn to the Lord Jesus as our Saviour and King. Now, like with Jeroboam, uh, God's judgment on us does not fall on us immediately. And Jeroboam's withered hand is healed. Now, the fate of uh, the man of God is a visible warning to Jeroboam that's, that's meant to turn him away. And so with us, God warns us. Our rebellion will be dealt with. But he gives us time to repent. He sends his son to die on the cross and take the punishment that we deserve. He raises him to new life as a visible sign to us that he is God's king, the one that we must submit to. And he sends out his people with the warning to repent, to receive the forgiveness of sins. But if we refuse to repent... If we refuse to bow the knee to King Jesus and receive the gift of salvation that he offers, if we persevere in defiance with hardened hearts, then this passage warns us, one day God's patience runs out. God's judgment will surely fall. We saw that in our New Testament reading from Romans chapter 2. Let me read from verse 4. Paul writes, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's what happened to Jeroboam, isn't it? God was patient. He waited. But he refused to repent. The inevitable judgment arrived. We too must repent. We must turn from our sins. We must embrace Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We must submit to his lordship. If we do so, God is gracious. He will forgive us. That's why he sent his son in the first place. To save us from our sins. Will you do that if you haven't already? Give up the rebellion. Submit to the word of the Lord. Give your life to the Lord Jesus. But if we refuse, if we harden our heart like Jeroboam, if we refuse to repent, then this passage warns us, God's judgment will fall. The day of his wrath will arrive. It may not be immediate, but it will certainly come at the end. And if that's true for the idolatrous unbeliever, it's also true of the Christian too. The Christian life is to not just begin with repentance, but continue in repentance. Yes, God forgives us of our every sin because of his son, but we must repent of them. And so if you are engaged in an affair, if you are addicted to pornography, if you are using corrupt practices at work, if you're dating an unbeliever or whatever sin that you are committing in defiance of Almighty God, you must repent. You must heed the word of the sovereign God. Listen to this word from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, 
nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. God's judgment will fall on such people. Verse 11, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So if we will turn from our sin, we can receive God's forgiveness, we can be washed clean of, of every sin that we may struggle with. But if we will not, we must not be deceived. God's judgment will fall. The unrighteous will not enter the kingdom of God and we will not be exempted simply because we are a leader or a teacher. We will not be exempted by power or position. We must listen to the word of the Lord. Disobedience is serious. It carries certain consequences. Well, finally, uh, what we learn from this passage is that God's promise is sure and it gives certain hope. God's promise is sure and it gives certain hope. I guess it's very easy to focus on the negative in the passage, the defiance and the destruction that follows, and, and to overlook the gospel message that shines through, with, through it. Because even in this passage, we see the grace of God, and we see God keeping his promise to his people. See, we must remember, as we come to this passage, that God had promised King David that one of his sons would always be on the throne. It's in 2 Samuel 7. Even when King Solomon sinned, God promised back in chapter 11, I will not tear away all the kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. God promised an eternal kingdom to David. And he was going to keep that promise. And we've been told in this chapter it would, it would be David's far-off descendant, Josiah, who would fulfill the prophecy of the man of God, who would bring the end to the line of Jeroboam and destroy the, the idols at Bethel. David's line would not end. And nothing, not even the disobedience and idolatry of Israel or the defiance of his prophet, <coughs> would stop God from fulfilling his promise. And so the certainty of God's word of judgment in this chapter, it serves to underline for us the certainty of God's promise. If God keeps his promise to judge Jeroboam, then it emphasizes all the more that God will keep his promise to usher in his kingdom, to bless his people. And of course, this is what he did. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, the, the great descendant of David, to be the perfect king. He would be the one who always obeyed, obeyed God's word, who, who refused to yield to the devil's temptation, who was never defiant, who resisted him in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, who resisted the devil's temptation in Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was never defiant. He was obedient even if it meant going to the cross because he knew that everything must happen according to the word of the Lord. Remember those words of the risen Lord Jesus in Luke 24. It says this, Luke 24 verse 44. Jesus said to them, These are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must happen be fulfilled. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the, from the dead. And so Jesus went to the cross in fulfillment of the word of God. He was raised again on the third day in fulfillment of the word of God. Now the gospel goes out to the nations in fulfillment of the the word of God. And because God's promise is sure and certain, we have a certain hope for the future. We can be certain one day the Lord Jesus will return in glory. One day God's defiant enemies will be judged once and for all. And one day God's people who have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus will enjoy the eternal blessings of his kingdom. God is sovereign. His supreme word must be heeded. Disobedience is serious. It carries certain consequences. 
God's promise is sure, it gives certain hope. And so let's turn away from our defiance. Let us leave behind our life of sin. May God soften our hearts to his word so that we embrace it entirely. We trust in his son and obey him as we wait for his return. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, severe warning in your word, this reminder that you are the sovereign God that we must listen to. Lord, we are also aware that we have all failed. We've all failed so many times uh, to obey you. If by our very nature we are sinners who live in defiance of you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God of such patience and grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have delayed your judgment, and not only delayed it, but sent your Son to take the judgment that we deserve. And so, Lord, help us to embrace your gospel word, to leave our old life behind and trust in your Son, to submit to his rule. Lord, whatever sins that we are still trapped in, Lord, help us to turn from them. Help us, Lord, to humbly submit, obey your word. Because we know, Lord, your promise is sure. Your kingdom is coming. And, Lord, we long for that day when we will be gathered in your eternal kingdom. So help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.